Well, again, um, I think that it is now almost noon, so welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I can tell you that um, I'm not able to read the chats because of my eyes, so they'll let me know if you're saying something and have a question. Um, and I can't see everybody all at once, so I don't know if you're asking and interrupting. But I do want you to stop me whenever you have a question or you want to challenge something. Because more than a PowerPoint presentation, which is what I've prepared, more than that, it is really an opportunity for discussion. I thought long and hard about whether I wanted to keep talking about the coronavirus, because I think in some ways we're tired of it. On the other hand, there are so many moral issues that are involved in do you open the economy, how do you open the economy, those sorts of, of concepts and questions. And I thought this would give all of us an opportunity to look at that and to talk about it. I am not coming at this from any kind of political position. I, as those of you who know from the Romeo presentations that I have, I try to be as even-handed as possible. It's impossible to keep politics completely out of these discussions, but hopefully I've done so. Also, I wanted to mention that I decided to take a look at this question as a part of a bigger picture, namely not only the question of do we open, how do we open, what are the concerns, but far beyond that, how do we go about thinking about making these kinds of decisions? Because to me, the kinds of concerns that we think about and how we think about them is far more important than the outcomes because it is in the thinking that the outcomes are eventually determined. Uh, that being said, um, let's go ahead and, or does anybody have any questions first? Okay, there will be time afterward for discussion. And I'm going to add to all of this a preview of the following. After we take a look at coronavirus and the issues facing the society, I'm going to ask you to take a look at the principles and concepts for making a decision and apply them to two situations. One, anything in your life that you're facing that you feel these might help with. And the other, not for a long discussion, but maybe a little bit and a lead in, do you think Israel should annex the West Bank? Does that give you enough of a intro? All right, so let's start out. Okay, and I want to move my box a little so I can, here we go. Beyond COVID-19, how to think when making difficult decisions, what's your paradigm? And I guess everyone knows what a paradigm is, but it's your, in German, Gestalt. It's the place that you start with your inbuilt assumptions, your inbuilt biases to, that you bring to any decision you make. I have that old joke, which I think points this out very beautifully, of the polling company during the Vietnam War that went around the country asking um, if Americans thought we should get out of Vietnam. This was in the 1960s. And one polling group went into an American Indian reservation and asked that question. And the interesting uh, result was that 72% of the Native Americans thought we ought to get out of Vietnam, while 100% felt we should get out of the United States. Um, that shows you the bias, the glasses, the lenses through which we tend to look at things 
and in many cases pre-decide how we want to act. And sometimes that's not always the safest way. So what is a safer way to make decisions? Next. What comes first, solutions or analyzing your approach? There's nothing like being between a rock and a hard place to make a step back and ponder our perspective. Tough decisions, especially between two unyielding options, test our, there we go, test our perspective. Tough decisions, especially, okay, test our problem solving abilities. Our instinct leads us to jump in and find solutions to our dilemmas without thinking about our assumptions. What are our biases? Are we optimists? Are we pessimists by nature? What should we consider first? Next. Thinking about our thinking might keep us from making unnecessary errors in judgment. This is true for the COVID-19 society opening quandary, as well as other seemingly impossible decisions we have to make. Though we're already opening society, the outcome is still in question. We want to preserve human health and economic health, but how do you do so both in the face, how do you do both in the face of the virus? There's nothing like a living laboratory, and that's how I'm looking at this, to test methods of thinking because healthy thinking leads to better solutions, okay? <clears throat> uh, we went a little too far, go back. So let's begin by looking at what our Jewish ancestors have said about all of this. Difficult decisions in the Bible. How did our ancestors approach tough decisions? I think all of you remember the story of the near, near uh, binding, well, the binding and near death by Abraham of his son Isaac. Abraham had to choose between fulfilling God's command to sacrifice his son as a show of faith and saving his son Isaac's life. Abraham decides showing faith takes priority and begins the sacrifice, but God saves Abraham from the consequences by intervening in the last moment. I don't expect God to intervene with a COVID-19. So Abraham does not tell us his decision-making process. I'm gonna stop here for a second. Other, he seems simply to decide that top priority is fulfilling God's mission. However, it's also the rabbi's note in the Midrash that he never does wake his wife, Sarah, up, the mother of Isaac, to ask her. Now, I'm not recommending this, but clearly in his decision-making process, he decided or just forgot to consult with his wife, Sarah. Any reaction? Okay. Um, by the way, I believe that this was written, and, and anthropologists generally agree, I believe that this story and its ending was written as a statement by the Israelites creating a new expectation in society and a new boundary, namely that Israelites, Hebrews, did not accept or engage in human sacrifice. Next. And then there was Job. You remember Job. God decides to test Job's faith by striking him with hardship. God takes away Job's children, his wife, his livestock, his form, farm. Job's friends tell him he has to done something wrong to deserve the, the evil. They tell him to apologize to God, even though
I also do not know absolutely where this virus is going or absolutely what the best route is to somehow balance between the two competing alternatives. Next. Here's, here's what Perlstein says about that. The answer to such questions is not easy or obvious. While we need to rely on doctors, scientists, and public health professionals for their best advice on health outcomes, and economists and business leaders for economic ones, the decisions about when and how to open the economy are ours to make collectively as citizens, not theirs. Next. Even the experts will acknowledge that their understanding of this virus remains imperfect. Their projections heavily dependent on best guess assumptions and conclusions framed in terms of probabilities, not sense not certainties. Next. So here are three concepts, two that we've already talked about. Trade-offs are inevitable. This is not science. The next one in making decisions, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Next. If half of all workers, customers, students, or participants can return to normal activities without causing a significant increase in the infection rate, certainly that's better than allowing nobody to do so. Better in terms of the economy, certainly, and better in terms of everyone's willingness to put up with whatever restrictions will need to remain in force. To me, that's interesting. It doesn't have to be perfect. We don't have to Aside from what we have now, which is a graduated opening, it could be that you could have a 50 or 100% opening by opening just to certain segments of the community. You have to consider that in looking at all difficult decisions, namely, okay, this isn't going to be the perfect decision, whatever it is. But um, even if it's not perfect, what would be good enough? And good enough is a very important part of that. The last thing I want to look at with regard to this is willingness to put up with. The one observation I have made with this opening and with the, um, the, the quarantine is the way in which our society decides that nobody can tell them what they need to do. And there's been a lot of, not a lot, but some violence with uh, the shutdown and also a definite attitude ramp up in terms of um, being a re refusal to deal with, uh, with ordinances uh, that are being set up to possibly keep us safe. And I see that as a huge danger. Okay, next. As an example, under carefully sanitized conditions, maybe half a company's employees could come back for a morning shift and half for an afternoon shift. And by the way, I haven't seen this in any of the um, uh, solutions today. That would allow people to maintain distance. Restaurants could open, as some have already proposed, with only half the number of usual tables available and additional steps to minimize contact. That I've seen, but not sh uh, shortening shifts and trading off. Next. Um, so here are three and a new concept. Trade-offs are inevitable. This is not a science. Don't let perfect be enemy of the good. The next one, test the logic of your thinking with reality. Next. Here's an analysis. This is an article from the Texas Tribune in Houston, Texas. This one is not from Pearlstein. Reopening just a little bit isn't really a big boon for the economy. Reopening Texas businesses in a contained way gives the appearance of throwing out a frozen, thawing out a frozen economy while keeping crowds at bay. 
That might make people feel better, but it's no way to supercharge an economy. In other words, what we're saying, what he's saying here is, okay, we say we're opening it up and we open up just a small part of it. Are we kidding ourselves? Next. So does it seem to square with, uh, with our objective in the end? That's not what's happening in Texas, he says. The reopening of the state so far is more an experiment about how to open, about how open the state can get without giving the pandemic an opening of its own. Governor Gray Abbott is allowing certain kinds of businesses to open in constricted ways. But the author says that's no way to make money. Next. A restaurant, he says, with 25% of its seats full is failing is a failing proposition. A hair salon that can only use two of its six chairs is not a going concern. A movie that attracts audiences sparse enough to leave 75 of every 100 seats empty is a flop on its way to streaming. Continue. Next. He's telling you, and here is the interesting part of reality and logic. He's telling you it's all right to go to the movies and it's too dangerous, but it's too dangerous to fill a movie theater with a regular crowd. It's safe to go to a restaurant if three out of four tables remain empty. A full but a full restaurant still, but while a full restaurant is a risk to your health. Do any of these make logical sense? So does the smell test of logic enable you to meet your objectives? And you can't forget your objectives in all of this. So whenever you're looking at an intractable seeming problem, does it seem like the solution you've come up with meets the last test of logic? Next. Rabbi, Rabbi we, have, we have two comments in the chat. Okay. Um, Judy asked or commented, some companies are currently allowing some employees to come in one day and other employees the next. Okay, good. Um, Myron, I don't know, you sent yours to me privately. Is that okay to share? No, he sent it to everyone. Oh, he did. Okay. So Myron said in, in the restaurant opening, shouldn't it be staged by the time frame between the incubation periods? 25 to 50% seem too quick. Are we waiting to see a spike to tell us to back off? Huh. No, this um, Skype. What was the last part of that? So saying that that the um, that we we increased the capacity from twenty five to fifty percent before or sooner than the incubation period. So we haven't seen the impact of the twenty five percent before raising to 50%. And, and he's saying that that's probably a prompt, could be a problem. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that could be the case. Um, and I guess in some ways this is, what we're doing now is uh, avoiding the perfect, which is nobody gets sick, and saying, okay, let's open a small amount and see how many people do get sick. Um, I have a comment on that in other than takeout, which was available before opening. Yeah. How many of us here would feel comfortable going to sit in a restaurant, either indoors or outdoors right now? It may be open, but how many of us as patrons would feel comfortable doing so? I've gone twice in the last week and I had no problem. Well, I think it depends on your risk level. Like Fred and I are both considered very high risk and we'll never go into a restaurant. But a takeout is okay. Um, we've, gone, we've gone to outside to eat outside and feel very comfortable with that. There's plenty of air circulation. It just depends. You know, if everybody would follow the rules and distance and wear masks, it would be so different. But the the things we saw over Memorial Day weekend, for me as a healthcare professional, are just frightening. It's like they have no regard for the cautionary things they're asking people to do. Well, I've gone to several restaurants so far, okay, but only outdoors. 
Yeah. But even well, outdoors, you have to wade your way through people sometimes in the street or to get there. So it just depends where it is. Like my son went outdoors at Hyde Park, but he said the place was packed. The streets were packed. Uh, so, I went to Newport Ritchie. <laughs> yeah, maybe less so. Yeah. Right, but, but when the, the deal is also that you and Fred um, make your own decisions. Sure, and I agree with that. People can make their own decisions, but I just wish people would not politicize the restrictions for health and safety. It's not political, it's common sense. Um, well, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna leave that uh, because I don't know, I'll accept the common sense. I don't know, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, but, um, you know, the whole deal, the whole question and, and the article from Houston raises it, is do you accomplish enough of your objective yeah. by just opening 25%? Right. And that's where Barbara commented that for a lot of businesses, it's cheaper to remain closed than yeah. to partially open. Yeah. And having to pay for utilities, supplies, and staff and taking mm -hmm. less money. Right. Any other comments so far on this? Okay. So I let's comment. Yeah. We have to really get back and we're dealing with lots of different universes. And depending on what universe you're coming from, like for example, I'm in, in an elderly universe. I may want to have a different uh, paradigm. And mm -hmm. I was, uh, I was a, uh, somebody who was left-handed. They may have a different paradigm. Yeah, good point, Mort. However, all of us with our individual universes, nevertheless, there's a threat out there to the entire human universe. And at some point, what a person who drills a hole under the seat of um, one seat of two people in a boat, it's going to affect the other. So that's true, but there's more than just us in our individual universes, which is what makes this so difficult. Yeah. A good point. Others? Well, um, I also agree with Lynn. Um, we're both in the very dangerous um, age group. So I can see by observe, observation I was that, move this um, way. Is that we're more conservative about distancing than a lot of people that are younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense. There you go. Um, Back forward. What do you want to do with it? Okay, so Bob, let's... Bob commented. Um, well, Judy first commented that twenty five percent doesn't work for a lot of businesses. Okay, and then Bob shared about a, a meeting he went to where where he was uncomfortable because because people weren't wearing masks. And that's, you know, that's another piece that I think Rabbi was, was alluding to, mm -hmm. which is when your decisions impact other people. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've, we've, and I'm, Rabbi, I'm sure you're talking about masks maybe later, but, you know, that that's where we've heard that that is protecting other people more than yourself. So what does that choice mean? Um, and then the other piece is what is our <laughs> obligation to those who aren't ready to go out into the world um, and honoring that um, that decision. And I've heard of, of people kind of pressuring people to go out and meet them out mm. and do things. And, and you know, what what is our role in, in when we have friends or family who are choosing to do different things than we are? And how do you eat with your mask on? Um, obviously, <laughs> obviously you don't, so, you know, unless you're protecting yourself, there could you be. Lift it up and put your money here for yeah. work in your mouth. <laughs> and I saw a couple of other comments, ch uh, chat up there. Um, Frank said, we're not in the same boat, even though we're in the same storm. Um, good, good point. Yep. And then talking about why masks have become a political statement. Hmm. I would like to say about this uh, condo building here in Maryland, where I am part time, that uh, it was mandated that in any public space, one had to wear a mask. 
the board of uh, directors of the, the building had, had voted. And um, so there was one uh, person who uh, posted that um, it was infringing on her right and she shouldn't uh, have to do it because of other people. And it went back and forth. And finally, one person uh, wrote that he was 87 and uh, his lungs are compromised. And would she be so kind as to consider other people who have specific problems? And then it became real to her and she agreed to do it. It was a, a knee jerk reaction, I think, on her part about it infringing on her right that we had to wear masks. But then when she understood it was coming from the other, that it, it, it changed uh, the dynamic. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Well said. Sometimes you have to, uh, yeah, the utilitarian rule uh, does, you know, does it do the best good for the greatest number of people? Um, doesn't always work because the greatest number isn't sometimes the ultimate uh, determining factor. I would um, ask for that woman in Maryland who didn't want to wear a mask. It was also a political decision. Yeah, um, I, I don't know if that was the case in Anne's case, uh, but well, certainly we, we have seen this one has to uh, the, the politicization, we have seen the politicization of mask wearing, but I don't want to go too much into that. And um, it may infringe on my right to decide whether I want to wear a mask or not. But my wearing a mask or not wearing a mask infringes on your right to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. And as you said, you that's what came out to what you people decided there. And finally, she understood that. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, not enough people understand that. Um, so one, like one more and then let's move on. Okay. I was going to say, similarly, when I was on a military base, the way it was explained to me was me getting a flu shot wasn't to protect me. It was from me getting the flu, carrying it to my workplace, infecting other people who then carried it home to their families. Got it. Yeah. And, you know, I just want to say real fast, this meeting, they set out the board table so the people were sitting basically shoulder to a shoulder. Nobody wore a mask. To me, if you don't wear a mask, you don't care about the uh, other people's health. Mm -hmm. And then I saw D Donna and Buddy had yeah. a question. So Jeff um, said something about the potential of indemnifying businesses against liability, which is something I've seen. Um, you know, but it, what is um, <clears throat> what is the responsibility of the businesses versus the individuals? And Donna and Buddy were talking about, you know, as things are opening up, um, you know, what happens when, when cases spike again? Um, you know, one analogy that I've heard is, is the, the dimmer switch. It's not a, an on-off switch, it's a dimmer switch. Um, but if it's moving very quickly, it, it can be harder to, to go back down. Yeah, putting genies back in bottles are never easy. And I just wonder if while putting the genie back in the bottle is left as an option, if those who make it an option really believe that they plan to do that if situations change. Um, I, I think that, that, that is a huge question. It's for indemnity, it's one thing to indemnify a business owner, but it's another to keep me from getting the virus, um, which to me is, in this case, the greater priority. All right, let's go ahead and move on, and we can talk about some of this later, um, but let's move on for now. So here are the four concepts. Trade-offs are inve inevitable not a science, don't let perfect enemy be enemy of the good, uh, test the logic of your thinking with reality. The next is play the probabilities. Let's take a look at that. One of the challenges of containing the virus 
is that many of those who get the virus don't even show any symptoms. But that also means that there are now likely millions of people who may already be immune. Uh, this writer said, and we're back to Pearlstein, priority should be placed on developing reliable tests for identifying those people, allowing them to form the vanguard of those getting back to work and school. Um, and to me, that makes a lot of sense. The question is reliability of tests. And then number two, getting enough out there uh, for everyone. I just read that in China, and I think it's pronounced Wuhan, they um, tested, I think, this is off the top of my head, 7 million people in two weeks, but my numbers could be wrong, but it was at a massive testing. But what he's saying here is uh, reduce the possibilities of risk by figuring out quickly who we can allow back out when we open up and allow them, give them priority. Any thoughts on that? Okay, next. I wanted, oh, uh, I think that was the end of it. Yeah, next. Uh, the next concept, what do you know for a fact? So if you're making a difficult decision, what do you already know that can influence your decision? What do you already know for a fact? Something that has been proven one way or another. Next. Social distancing works. We can see that for a fact. The pandemic gave us uh, all a math lesson in exponential growth. One, 10 infect, uh, one infects 10, 10 infect 100, 100 infect 10,000, and so forth. But the reverse is also true. Significantly reducing contacts dramatically reduces the infection rate to a more manageable level. In places where it was done early enough, um, month-long hiatus succeeded in flattening the curve and preventing a big spike in infections that threatened to overwhelm the healthcare system. Next, so we know that to be true. But social distancing was never expected to eradicate the virus or thoroughly contain it. Now that it has succeeded, however, it offers the opportunity for many people to go back to many activities under carefully controlled conditions, keeping the curve relatively flat, but never eliminating it entirely. Um, again, here is a reality of fact that if you make the decision to open up before the, the virus is dead, or I'm gonna add a cure, a vaccine, then you do have to accept in any difficult decision you're making what actually seems to be working even though it's not perfect. Next. Next is prioritize the steps to be taken. Next. Prioritize workers over investors is the best way. And I think a lot of people here between for the next two prioritization uh, ideas, th this should lead to a lot of discussion. Maybe the only way, the author says, to put a floor under the economic recession is to prevent large numbers of businesses from going under. And with little or no cash coming in, the only way to prevent many businesses from going under is for them to put off paying some of their bills. Next. The most logical candidates, payments to landlords uh, and lenders. Generally speaking, lenders are in a better financial position than workers and suppliers to wait for their money. Thoughts on that? None. Okay. I'd say, it, I'd say it depends. Not all land landlords are in a better position um, to not have the money. I'd say it really depends. Lenders, it might be true of lenders, but I don't know if it's true of landlords. And I don't think, and I don't think that the uh, uh, some landlords may, 
may be in that position. Others may be sufficiently leveraged that they too are expecting at monthly to have the, the, uh, uh, the income that they've had before. Yeah. Yeah, who can make a statement like that? How is a landlord any different than a supplier? Yeah. Yeah, that seemed somebody else was going to say something. But then you have to look at it another way. If you're not able to afford to pay your rent, do you toss all these people um, out of their homes and toss them on the streets because of this uh, horrible thing? Yeah. Um, with the landlords, the problem you have there is <clears throat> if the land, if the tenants are given permission to delay paying the rent because of whatever reason, or homeowners paying the mortgages, then the landlords need to be given permission to forgo paying their mortgages. Mm -hmm. And then it gets to the financial institutions. But in some cases, the landlords are not much more than what the tenants are as far as financially. Uh-huh. Okay. Um, by, by paying the, yeah, the, Dan is the saying, landlords and lenders, you're following this whole trickle-down process in, in, in economic theory. Bas um, basically that. Barbara, Barbara uh, was reinforcing that there are landlords who are late on their mortgage because they're not getting rent. Mm -hmm. uh, Mort, would you repeat what you said again? I was going to say it's a, an old theory of a trickle-down process where you don't give it at the end. You're really pumping a prime up, uh, pumping the uh, prime, sorry, pumping, mm -hmm. uh, pumping the, uh, the pump. Uh, now you have uh, 60. And uh, senior moments, uh, and uh, it's my, it's a less direct way of of, uh, of in getting the economy going. Because you give the funds to people on the lower income group, that's going to get into the markets very quickly. Yeah. Whereas the other case, it trickles down. It's not getting too complicated. Right. Yeah, uh, and that also is an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, I, I did. The Times had an article today yeah. about um, this very thing about um, renters not being mm -hmm. able to pay their rent, and uh, they predict that there's going to be a terrible problem because the people are going to get kicked out of their rentals. Yep. Um, so I don't think this his this particular uh, suggestion in terms of what he thinks is a uh, reasonable priority in making the decision. I think it includes an assumption here that hasn't taken the complexity of the financial tree into account. So I assume, and what I'm hearing is that most or many of you would not um, be in favor of um, what am I trying to say? In, in favor of um, not having, would not be in favor of, let's put it this way, the um, people who you would not bring back and you would not worry about the financial effect on landlords and, and lenders because landlords in particular are in the same problem as renters, same position. Okay, next, here's his other priority. Next, prioritize low wage workers over high. Cash strapped businesses, governments and universities could temporarily reduce paycheck for highly paid workers who can clearly get by with less and use the seven savings to keep more workers on the payroll and keep money flowing to cash-strapped suppliers. Any foregone compensation could be repaid later in the form of cash or stock or extra vacation time. How do you react to that? 
in one respect, I think it's similar to what they say is that those who can afford to work from home are normally the middle to upper class and the lower class have jobs where you can't work from home. So they were forced to go to work if, if work still existed. In some cases it didn't, but the lower socioeconomic classes are the ones who suffered by not being able to work from home. And this is quite similar. The and upper the get rich while the poor get poor. Well, yeah, I just read somewhere that one of the companies that's filing for bankruptcy gave all their top execs big bonuses before they filed for bankruptcy. And in my moral world, that is just so wrong. And I know that you know, I know people who are just desperate for any kind of basic paycheck so they can eat. Well, that's true. Those of us who have more just have to realize we have to accept less at this time too. Extra vacation time doesn't pay the rent. No, it doesn't. It yeah. doesn't. And there's that's another the problem if you just casually throw out employment agreements and contracts, you throw the business world into chaos. People can no longer depend on what they were promised. Uh, that can't come out well. No. You know, for individuals, there are uh, different standards of living. And where you might have somebody who, uh, without the ploy of bankruptcy and all of that other stuff, uh, where people live at a certain standard of living because they are higher income. And so they would be suffering the same way okay, as the, the person in the lower economic scale. Right. And that's that's what Art shared in the in the chat. But who's the one to decide who can make it and who can't? Yeah. Yeah. Cal State University in California, the largest four year university in the United States, is going to cut everybody ten percent on their yeah. payroll. The um you go ahead, Lynn. I think it's going to be a wake-up call for many of the younger people who have always lived, you know, with the aspiration, I'll make more, I'll make more, and they keep buying more and better and bigger, and that they'll realize that that's not the way to live your life. You need to plan for a rainy day and cut back. Those of us in, you know, income brackets who could do that, my heart goes out to the people who really, like the, the day workers and the hourly workers who really can't afford food. And I know that it, it's a hard question because some of them are in positions where we, we place them at risk by going back to work, their health risks. So it's unfortunate. Well, notice his idea is to prioritize low wage workers over high uh, in who we allow to go back to work. What about this whole concept of figuring out um, which segments of the population go back based on certain criteria. Carl, were you getting ready to say something? No, I'm just having a hard time uh, relating this to the first part of your talk today. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think okay. you have to hope that individual small business owners have some kind of a moral compass and make the right decisions and that's a hard thing to do, but I, I own a company and our, our goal was to keep everybody employed. And who took the pay cut? Me. They quit paying me because I didn't need it. But everybody stayed employed and I feel very, very good inside that we did that. Yeah, and Carl, the, 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 here, the key here is that one of the concepts, one of the criteria is how do you prioritize your, uh, the steps that you take in solutions to solving difficult problems. And this particular author uh, prioritizes this in the two ways that we just looked at. Um, next. So those are um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And there is one other uh, that is very important that I failed to put on here. And that is, how realistic is the solution that you've come up with? Um, can you think of other testing concepts to add to the list? How about all or nothing thinking? 
pessimistic, optimistic thinking. There are all kinds of ways. What I'm going to show you next are four different solutions. Um, we'll go ahead to that, um, to that slide. Four plans for reopening. How do they meet the concept tests? And again, I believe these four ways raise the question of whatever ultimately you come up with as a solution, how realistic is it within the society in which we live? We'll now share a summary of four plans put forth for reopening the economy while remaining physically as safe as possible. Two plans reflect liberal views, two reflect conservative views. How do they compare to each other and do they meet the uh, concept smell test? And I'll add including how realistic are they? See the plans now and so they're going to be posted. What's your reaction? Next. I don't think that's it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yeah, can you I read can that? Hmm? Plan one. Uh, this comes from the Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard. It envisions a surveillance state put in place to fight the pandemic alongside a mass testing effort. Um, I'm just trying to read. Distancing guidelines. Okay. Hosp you, put, you would open up after this, these conditions. There we go. Um, hospitals have ensured capacity to see, to treat all patient, uh, virus patients. Mass testing operations is, apparatus is in place. Production of uh, personal protective equipment is massively ramped up to the point that every American can acquire and wear a face mask. Um, still, normal life would require, require um, implementing robust testing in every part of the U.S. What do you think about this plan, everybody? Unrealistic. From the health experts. Unrealistic. Why do you say that, Carl? I don't think our people in this country will put up with a surveillance state. Okay. And it specifically does not mention the contact tracing, which would be the intrusive part of the surveillance state, uh, or that testing be mandated. Uh, probably wouldn't go over in Texas, probably go over pretty well in New York. Okay, it's so also an expensive plan. There's a lot of cost associated with this. Right. One of the things that I noticed about Japan, it's assuming they are reporting their deaths and their cases honestly is that they immediately after a delay at the beginning sent masks and protective wear to everybody in their society or their country different okay. culture different possibilities uh, you mentioned the wuhan current massive testing um and it is true there were millions and millions and millions of tests done over a period of a little over a week um, but that was because six new cases arose. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we have the will and probably not the capacity to respond to a, a recurrence, a resurgence of six cases in one area with that kind of effort. Right. Okay, let's look at plan two. That's still, there we go. This is the conservative-leaning American Enterprise Institute. The AEI said public gatherings should be kept to fewer than 50 people at a time. Public spaces should be roughly uh, regularly disinfected. The plan laid out by the AEI broke down, reopening the, the economy into simple several phases. The think tank said individual states could move on to phase two 
after a 14-day sustained drop in coronavirus cases and assurance of their ability to safely diagnose, treat, and isolate cases and their contacts. Um, has that been done as we're opening up? No. It was announced, but not done. Okay. Uh, during this phase, schools and businesses can reopen and much of normal life can begin to resume. So that's after 14 days. Does that sound reasonable to most people? With the proper testing. So all of those would have to be in place. Um, he That's goes reasonable. on to say the AI said limited social distancing would still need to be in place, particularly for older adults, high risk from the virus. Public gatherings should be kept limited to fewer 50 people at a time. That's interesting. Everyone would be encouraged to wear non-medical masks and the organization called for regular deep cleanings of shared public places. Um, how realistic is this one? Uh, I think it's been expressed before. If there's a will, there would be a way. Mm -hmm. But in this country, is there a will to do it? Yeah, and um, Dana asks, how is it enforced? What if, and I missed it after that. <clears throat> oh. Excuse me, but that was put in place and nobody followed it. That, that plan was put in place by the man at the top mm -hmm. that with 14 days of a declining uh, number of, uh, that where the numbers didn't go up, and I mean, I know you didn't want to get political, but this is all come, this is political. It's political for him not to wear a mask because he doesn't look masculine. So all these ideas are great. If we had someone at the top that would have a plan and stick to us, stick to it and let us know uh, at, at what's going on. But instead he, he just keeps on lying to us about the numbers. I know the numbers are more. And he keeps on yeah. saying you can open up in 14 days when the numbers are down, but everybody's opening up before. Gail, yeah, I hear you. Um, however, two things. Um, there are uh, two different groups making recommendations. One is the White House, but the other is the CDC. Mm -hmm. And the White House could not be um, setting aside what the CDC wants if there weren't in this country an appetite to do exactly that. Right. And so I think we have to be realistic in reading the country. And there seems to be, and I don't know what significant means, but there seems to be a group in the country who totally agrees with the White House. Right, his and base. That is, which is that um, the country does not have a right, the government does not have a right to make these rules. Um, and so you can't just blame it. You can't blame it on the White House. The White House is reflecting a political reality in the country just like the CDC is, is reflecting a political reality. But he's supposed to get advice from the, the CDC and the World Health Organization, but he doesn't adhere to any advice that anybody gives him. And I know that his base would follow him into a boiling pot of water or whatever. Yeah, we're getting into a political here. But it is political. Which, this um, virus is political. Yeah, but we're looking at a plan, at the plan. Right. And yes, the virus is in itself not political. It doesn't care who it strikes. Right. The reaction is political. And what I'm saying is that there are on both sides and in the middle of this question, this difficult decision, there are um, very strong feelings and that the people who choose to follow certain segments 
um, have a right to their feelings and are uh, making that clear. So right. and, uh, and, I don't, and that, so, that's and, true. And that's I, and I don't want to go beyond that with regard. Right. I agree with that. Yeah. And yes, um, and uh, Buddy and uh, Donna and Buddy um, are absolutely right. You can't enforce a law uh, or a rule or whatever. You cannot, and if you can't enforce it, it really doesn't make sense um, and it won't work, which means that like the first one, this plan is also, I think, unrealistic. And also we aren't getting the true numbers of how many are actually getting sick, there are people not allowed to be tested. There are states in which the governor is saying, we don't want to have the true numbers. Yeah. Um, the only thing I learned from my senior rabbi when I was a young assistant is not to make rules that you can't enforce. Um, when I came to Shari Tzedek, it was a rule that you had to promise that you um, were going to continue to and go to confirmation after you were bar mitzvah, but nobody followed that promise, uh, which is why I made the changes that I did. There's a saying in sociology that where the mores are strong, where the cultural boundaries and expectations are strong, you don't need laws, and where the mores are weak, where the boundaries are weak in terms of what's considered normal in a society, the laws do no good. And That's what's so disappointing in society. And I is, mean, it just, it just didn't occur now. It's been going on for a long time. Right, but, but, Gail, but Gail, it's a reality. I just it is a reality. Chat, I saw a chat come up. What did that one say? So, so there have been two. Um, Barbara had also talked about enforcement. Um, Art was talking about the funds that have been dispersed and um, how often they've been taken advantage of and gone to the wrong to the wrong people and and where is the accountability? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then Barbara was talking about the role that leadership can play in in inspiring faith, talking okay. about FDR during the depression and how many people were depositing money into banks. Um, you know, even after so much had been lost. <clears throat> so let's talk about that. I think there are others who'd like to talk about this. Harry, were you going to say something? Yeah, I mean, yeah, while there's a lot of, the question is, who rules the different segments of society? And does one segment have a um, embedded authority that is unfair to the other segments? In other words, does government have a leg up on what gets done? Rabbi? Yep. Well, here's an example. Both of my uh, grandchildren are in college and they go to colleges in the South. One's at the University of Texas and one is at Manson. Tennessee. Tennessee. Um, and um, they were sent home early because the school was closed. But now both of those universities are going to open for business in the fall. Now, obviously they seem to be able to make that decision. Um, and it makes me very worried and I noticed that uh, universities and colleges in the North are not saying that they may do it, but they're not saying that they're going to do it. Uh, but it doesn't, ha in, in a huge institution like the University of Tennessee, how is it possible to keep people safe? This is the cultural problem that we had. And this was pointed out in what states were opening faster than others and where they were located. It's the culture of 
what I used to say in Florida, the attitude, and I'm not sure it hasn't changed, welcome Yankees, meaning people from up north, leave your money now, go home. And they don't want to hear how it's done up north. This is how we do it, whether you do it that way or not. They don't care how it's done and whether it might be better or not. This is Florida. This is how we're going to do it. The same thing all over the South compared to other parts of the country. You know, I think the American mindset has a inbuilt um, attitude or paradigm that essentially we have free choice in everything we do. And therefore, it becomes very difficult to, um, I believe, to, to enforce many laws. And, um, but there doesn't seem to be an appetite out there to change that reality. Um, and even if there is, in terms of a 30-day lockdown that we had, basically, I don't think that there is a sense of sustainability, a willingness to um, give up liberty for any particular uh, period of time. And that's always going to be a problem with these plans and with these ideas. Um, let's go to plan three quickly. It's pretty much the same. Rabbi, before we do, Judy Manowitz has raised her hand. Okay. No, I haven't. <laughs> I must have touched something incorrectly. No. <laughs> but I did uh, agree with Lynn Miriam earlier about the, um, the comments about the high wage workers and the low wage workers and cutting the pay. And many companies have, have done that. And <clears throat> it, it does seem like a very fair thing to do. Um, with the low-wage people who barely can make a living, they need to get their income. <clears throat> and people at the top, you know, maybe we don't realize what some people need to live, but often people can take some cut in pay, um, especially if it's temporary. Yeah. By the um, way, while, while we're paused, I do, unfortunately, I have to run as well. Um, so I, I want to thank Rabbi. I'm not going to be able to watch the, the chat, but I know Lisa is on too. Um, and I want to remind everyone, uh, an email went out this morning with Shavuot information. I have a lunch and learn tomorrow, kind of Shavuot one-on-one. -on -one. We will not be talking about the coronavirus. So um, anyone who wants to join then, and then there's some study tomorrow night too, and it would be great to see you all there. And Yisker will be on Zoom uh, Friday morning. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. No, thanks, Rabbi. Rabbi thank you. We're, we're going to wrap up. We, we have a Shabbat service tomorrow night, too? Yeah, it's online. It's with okay. our conservative uh, friends as well. And um, I know a lot of you are, are interested in, in the temple's plan. Um, you know, we're taking all of these things really, really seriously. Um, you know, we do view the synagogue different than restaurants or other things that, that we are able to you know, we are open. We believe very much that we're essential, um, but we also believe that, that we're open right now in the safest way possible. Um, so I'll be sending something out soon, but, you know, I, we have announced nothing through the summer. Um, the building's going to stay closed. We're going to stay online. Um, not judging people who are making different choices, but recognizing the people who are in our building the most often and wanting to protect them along with our staff. So we view that we're very much open, um, even though even though our building is closed. And I'm going to wrap up in five minutes. So everybody hold on. Thanks, Rabbi Simon. All right, sorry, Thank I have another call. I'll see you all soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, plan three very quickly and plan four quickly. Rabbi Bernholtz, there are a few things uh, okay, in the go chat. Ahead. Did you want yeah, to do I just, that or I, do the plan? I, I have all day, but I didn't want to keep people too long. Go ahead. Okay, so first a couple people agree that a charismatic and respected leader is, uh, you know, sets the stage for people to move in the right directions. Yeah. Um, also, Jeff Gross did say, first, this is house arrest, not quarantine. We all grew up with movies and newsreels that showed quarantine signs of houses with someone infected. That was appropriate. Second, ordinances and laws are created by legislatures, not governors or presidents. 
executives can really only make recommendations. And third, because of the number of people who are asymptomatic, the true infection transmission rate appears to be approximately 1 to 0.4, not 1 to 2.4, or even 10 that was originally promulgated. Okay, that gives us lots to talk about. Anybody want to react to those? A lot of suppositions. Yeah. A lot of suppositions, because nobody yeah. knows. Nobody knows how many there are, because nobody, because not enough tests. And I'm also not under house arrest. I can walk out whenever I feel like it. And if uh, Jeff feels like he wants to go out, go on out. Nobody's making you stay home. This morning on the news, they mentioned that uh, of the testing is roughly 50% in error. And so that they've got to retest. They need, there are too many tests that they haven't tested to see if they're accurate. And the fact that what was brought out early on, the more tests you have, the more you find out who has the disease, the numbers would go up, but then you can contain it. But that's the problem of the testing. We were six weeks late on testing and we still have not maintained for the United States a testing that would be fair to our people. For us, I mean, it's, it's just outrageous. Um, Jeff, what do you have to say to Carl's comment? Is Jeff there? Jeff, you're on mute. Did you unmute him? I can't, but I can ask him to unmute. Okay. Uh, that yes, you can go everywhere that you want, but it is, uh, instead of quarantining those who are ill, which was completely appropriate, Telling everyone stay at home uh, is not appropriate. You're free to go wherever you want to go. Yep, has a very good point. The problem is the reason why they issue the, the requesting stay at home or telling you to stay at home basically was because they didn't do the testing. Right. If they had done the testing, then they could have quarantined only those people who needed to be. So in lieu of doing proper testing, they said everybody. That's the problem. I think, what, pro we're for I think what we're forgetting is the purpose of the quarantining wasn't to eliminate it. As a matter of fact, it makes the outbreak last longer. It was to flatten the curve so that healthcare is not overwhelmed by a sudden surge. Right. Do those make sense to you, Jeff? Unless I'm incorrect, the uh, healthcare system was not overwhelmed. There was, there was, excuse me, there was the hype about it going to be overwhelmed. And other than uh, places like New York, uh, the system was not particularly overwhelmed. Have you listened to the reports recently from Alabama and Arkansas? They have had an increase, that is true. Their health I, systems are overwhelmed at this point. Certain areas were overwhelmed. Certain areas would have been overwhelmed if there had not been the people social distancing. Or Plus, they didn't have the PPE, nor did they have the respirators in any hospitals. There was there were there was nothing. There was nothing left. the The program had been dis, uh, dis you know, had been cut down and taken out of the White House. So, well, respirators were never stocked. They were never stocked from the previous administration, and fortunately, we ramped it up so fast there never was a shortage. No one was denied a respirator. Good point. I don't know that that's true. 
I, I never saw anything that showed that there was a, a lack of respirators. They were taking respirators and making two respirators out of them that uh, we don't know what, what went on. We, it, it's like 9-11. Mm -hmm. We're not going to know all the facts for years to come of what, did, we, what we did have, what we didn't have. And at this point, it doesn't matter. We have a problem that we have to address right now. And Russell points out that um, Russell points out though that everyone is is and was still free to go out. Nobody was arrested. Right. I yeah. What's plan three? Go, Lisa. Plan three. This is the li liberal leaning Center for American Progress. Um, they want. Uh, people to get the coronavirus test results in a tel cell phone app. Uh, they argue that social distancing restrictions should be lifted after 45 days. Obviously, this was before. Indicating normal uh, economic activity would re wouldn't resume in the U U.S. until late May. Vastly ramped up testing and production of medical equipment would need to occur in the meantime. Um, it also calls for instantaneous contact tracing to limit any outbreaks used like technology is used in Singapore and South Korea as a critical part of their success. These countries use cell phone apps to notify people if they came into contact with someone infected with a virus. The think tank says the U.S. should adopt a similar approach, the one sensitive to individual privacy. Either way, it should be a remarkable expansion of surveillance powers in the U.S. A trusted nonprofit organization should host sensitive medical data and not private companies nor the federal government. The data would be deleted after 45 days and the amount shared among public health agencies limited to where possible. As a condition of receiving the test, in the future, individuals may be required to download the app, which would include their test result plan. Uh, for others, the app would be voluntary, though the vast majority could be expected to download it to see if there are any cases in their neighborhood or near their workplaces. What do you think about that? Totally unrealistic in our society. It, it's wonderful, except Everybody wants to say personal freedom, it infringes, so therefore we can't do it. Yeah, I want, do it. yeah go ahead. Whether it's good for the health of the country or not, people aren't concerned about that. They're more concerned about their privacy and not making sure that people don't know what's going on and therefore maybe containing the virus. Yeah, and Jeff says, who, who determines who's trusted? I agree with that one. That's way uh, to go. Good call on trusted? that one, Jeff. Who is trusted? <laughs> um, it, it's a sad situation we've got, but I can't say, and this is political, throughout history, um, trust has always been an issue. Um, one of the great teachings of the rabbis in Pirkei Avot is don't trust the government. Um, and that goes for any government, by the way. Let's look at, I think this is unrealistic too. Plan four, foundation for research on equal opportunity. It says, and this is much like what Perlstein said, young adults should be allowed to go to back to work, though anyone wanting to travel on a train or passenger plane must prove they tested negative. The plan emphasized U.S. cannot sustain an endless economic shutdown to curb the virus. The conservative-leaning organization, which this is, uh, called to allow younger people to head back to work since they are less at risk from a severe case of the virus compared to older adults. They also say pre-K and K schools should be reopened though mass gathering should still be restricted to keep the rate of transmission manageable. States should continue to prohibit large group gatherings like sporting events, concerts, conventions, and theme parks. 
People wanting to travel on Amtrak or passenger planes should be required to demonstrate they tested negative for the virus via a contact tracking app. Um, also suggest Congress allow states to temporarily restrict interstate travel by car from a bordering state undergoing a <laughs> coronavirus outbreak. Thoughts? Well, they all said... In regard to sports, uh, it directly affected me because I no longer have any officiating going on. I have heard that supposedly Governor DeSantis has stated that they may allow new sports to restart up again. But I thought it was very interesting. Yahoo put something out about the 1918 through 20 pandemic showing baseball and now to find that in Boston that year, and the Red Sox won the World Series back then, uh, they played some of their games in the larger Braves Park rather than Fenway. It was also World War I and the return and big events going on and everything spiked. There was a picture that Yahoo put up of a baseball game where the batter, catcher, and umpire all wearing masks. Yeah. What, then what there was a picture of Georgia Tech football game, all the fans wearing masks, but say, noticing that there were no high school sports during that time. And Robert, <laughs> Robert, Robert uh, in, in interest of time, um, I, I do get that picture literally, uh, and it's a very good point. Uh, with this plan four, uh, what does everybody think about the schools, um, the um, and the stopping of interstate traffic? I think we need very definitely a very quick and and reliable test. I mean, so many people are waiting and we feel there are a lot of false pos or false negatives at this point. So without really better testing and easier and cheaper and faster, I don't think it can work. Okay. Um, so it's unrealistic under present conditions. I don't think you can I don't think you can paint Amtrak with a broad brush. I recently traveled on Amtrak. The terminal required social distancing. Everyone had to wear masks. We traveled in a private compartment. The staff wore masks and they brought food, our food to our room. So we had minimal contact with anyone. So you say it is possible? Yes. Okay. Uh, in regards to schools, I know it's a very small percentage, but New York and several other big cities have had these kids that have had a what they think is related to the virus outbreak. And we don't know whether it is related or not or how that would affect. And it's the kids going to school that may or may not have it, who may contact somebody who does, who brings it home to their elderly parents. Okay. Again, no testing. Anybody else? My cousin's son-in-law is a principal of a charter school up in New York. And my cousin was saying that he doesn't see how, how they're going to be able to open up the school in the fall with all the proper spacing that they're, that they're going to need. And that is just one school. As a teacher, I worry very much about the uh, idea that they will take children's temperature and let them into to classrooms when we know that m many children are asymptomatic. And so that would not solve the problem. Plus, how do you keep young children from interacting with, with each other and they're germy anyway? So it's, it's a very big problem, I think, for young children. It gets easier as they get older. And then the children, then the children are also going to take, you know, go home. And if they're infected, infect the parents. I, I think not having young children in school is, is really going to be killing a lot of these children, especially in the lower income families mm. where the parents can't help them. They're going to be using a, losing a year or more of education, which they may never recover. They're not getting fed. 
I think it's a real problem. At the older grades, they could do more online learning and the children can do that. At the younger grades, it's not working. And you're really destroying some of these children's lives forever by not having them in school. It is a problem. And they can go, I've read one solution, is split shifts. And I know in New York City, years ago when I was a child, they did have split shifts in some schools, which where you went, some went in the morning and some went later in the afternoon because they didn't have enough school buildings. And you have to do something for the young, the elementary and middle school and preschool children. They have to have education and they're not getting it. Um, you'll notice that this one is more conservative leaning, this group. Um, and so what I see reflected in it is a, perhaps an underlying priority in the decision making, which is if you don't send children back to school, how do you send <clears throat> people back to work? That's it. Um, <clears throat> and the city of the Temple Terrace, which is where I live, we're going through something here. And I wrote a letter to the mayor and to the council. It's like, what about July 4th? We may be the only city to have the fireworks. We're still planning on going through all of the activities in which the main sponsor of the July 4th activities is the Baptist Church. And they're saying that they still may hold the um, activities on the force, which to me could be extremely dangerous. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry about the phone. I can't turn it off. It'll stop um, you. I just have one comment about the um, public school. I have been substitute teaching in middle school and high school for the last two years. And um, I will tell you that um, what um, what what really stood out to me was the amount of contact the children had with one another. And I kept on bringing that up to them. Get your fingers out of each other's hair. Do not touch each other. This was before any of this started, of course. And they, ha they just were like, they just had no idea what I was talking about. Um, I did, I also substitute at the Hillel Academy and I did not have that problem there as much. But um, I think what's happened to the school arena in general is that too many funds have been cut. Um, there isn't enough money in the school and the parenting, there's no following up with the parents. Um, it, we're in a mess in our education, that's for sure. Right. Uh, I don't want to go too far afield though, Great Gail. Yeah, well, yeah, no, but I'm just saying, as far as making a decision on what you're going to do in schools, it, they're having a problem already with getting an education, so. But still, to me, the biggest question is, if you don't get the schools open, how do you get the people back to work? Anybody? Well, the teachers will have to teach online. But that, but that's in people's homes, Right. Right. Who's going right. to who's going to watch the kids? Well, they were never watched. I mean, some people. I'm I'm just saying a segment of them were um, latchkey to begin with. Yeah. I, even when I was a single mother, there was something <clears throat> called latchkey. Of course, I never would right. did that, but there were there was that going on, and um, that's why I went into substitute teaching. I wanted to see what was going on with mm -hmm. that age group. Right. Of middle well, I'm, school I'm, and high school. I'm wondering of, of the four, if you can remember back there, uh, do, do any of these seem realistic to you? Certainly the idea of ending interstate commerce seems impossible and I doubt if it's even legally possible. It's the institutionalizing a age discrimination also seems very problematic. Yeah, but it's interesting that our governor here in Florida stopped all traffic from Louisiana at the border. <laughs> and also New York and New Jersey. It's the same. Mm -hmm. A friend of mine two weeks ago had driven down to Delray Beach and was stopped at the border and had to register where they were going. She, she was moving down there and she had to self-isolate for 14 days while they're stopping people on 95 also. So Registering seems, seems possible, but closing the borders 
is almost certainly unconstitutional. Right. What seems to be going on is cherry picking. Yeah. Uh, using those laws and those um, um, pronouncements and declarations that those making them want to use and not be following or using ones they don't. So there seems to be an underlying power inequality going on here. Rabbi, there's, I got a, I got a comment. Yeah. There's, there's something in every generation that happens that screws up some segment of society, whether it's the flu, the Spanish flu, or the Great Depression, or the Vietnam War, or the polio epidemic, or whatever you want to call it. There's always somebody's going to, going to lose. And it's an unfortunate consequence. Uh, I think we just have to deal with it and uh, not moan and groan quite as much and try to be realistic about things rather than uh, cherry picking everything we want to uh, complain about. Yeah. About the schools, please take a look at uh, the, the, uh, the link I posted, but also that there has been, there has not been a single reported instance of a child under 10 transmitting the virus to an adult. So. But there have been deaths. I don't know that we know that's to be true. Right. Yeah, there were some deaths from coronavirus of kids under 10. That's not what I said, time. Robert. I said of children transmitting it to adults. And I did post the link there. We you're don't welcome. know if it's been You're welcome to read it yourself. We okay. haven't done the test to know that it's been transmitted or not. Right. All four of these plans seem to have a lot to do with tests. Yeah. And if, if the country wanted to decide that it wanted to do things properly, then we could do the testing and go from there. Right. And the scientists have all, the Fauci was the first, one of the first ones to say, we do all these testing, then we can decide how to open up. And that's not what we've done. Okay. Of course. Um, um, it says, Jeff, please post again. I don't see. All right, let's go to the next slide, Lisa. And this is the last one. No. Nope. Give me just a second while I pull that up, please. Okay. <laughs> Have any of the concepts that we've talked about you with making difficult decisions helped you? <laughs> no. Oh, that's really yeah. helpful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, until to me, until they come out with a vaccine, I, the only place I go is to the grocery store and to doctors. That's it. I'm scared of leaving my house because I am one of those high risk people. So until they come out with a vaccine and tests, um, nothing really changed. Uh, you know, uh, for me. Okay. Um, well, I think I certainly think that by at least looking at the way, the process, and the steps, the concepts that Pearlstein went and looked at in order to come up with his solution for opening, there were certainly things in that that will help me in making decisions later on. Uh, we're certainly not going to talk about it now, and I don't know why this came up, but um, how many would be interested next month in talking about uh, should Israel annex parts of the West Bank? I would. I don't hear an overwhelming response. It be an interesting topic. Yes. Yeah. There's a few hands raised. Right? I would. Yeah, yeah I, would would be, I would be interested oh, in that. You see oh, us? This is Margarita. It's another Margarita. topic with it's another topic that we can all agree on, but but is unrealistic because you have to have two sides in the argument. Okay, so that took care of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it. Would, <laughs> think about it. No, I I think mm -hmm. it would be. I've like to know firm days so I can have my doctor's appointments around them. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I, I think we might try to do that. Um, it's certainly an issue for me, and, and I 
benefit from body, everybody else's thinking. Well, um, again, I hope it helped in some ways. I think it clarified a lot of issues for us. Testing remains a problem, it seems to me. Number two, um, guidelines don't seem to be followed. Um, number three, that there does not seem to be a um, huge appetite in the country, in our country, which values individual freedom for um, guidelines or, or any kind of enforcement of them. And uh, finally, that um, all kinds of solutions people offer sound good, but often are just not realistic. And finally, that I believe either the leaders of our country or the country has decided that we're just going to open up. And that's what's happening. And we'll see how it goes. Rabbi, thank can you? you? Rabbi, very good presentation. Very enlightening. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, right. Rabbi. Thanks, Rabbi. Anna. Yes, thank you. Everybody, stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you, Rabbi. Stay good. Bye. Good job, everybody. All of you, stay healthy. And a big hand for Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for coming. Bye bye. Thank you. You're welcome. Adios. Bye bye.